Uh, good evening and welcome everybody to this segment of Latea Remotos Tertulia. This is the last Tertulia of the year 2020, which has been quite a year. And because of that, or perhaps in spite of that, we have a remarkable guest, um, a well-known poet, um, perhaps a second generation of New Yorican poets, you know, and uh, and someone that's been working very diligently to keep the to keep the spirit alive, especially as she uh, she just comes from hosting Miguel Abration, the epic tribute to Miguel Algarín that was just recently held. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Nancy Mercado. Nancy, ¿cómo está? ¿Cómo está? Gracias por, gracias por invitarme. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that being here with you. And thank goodness it's, uh, it's almost the end of 2020, you know? I know, I know, my God. <laughs> thank God it's about to end. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I know you've been very busy at, uh, since we have, uh, you know, it's been a year of, of challenges and also of losses. This has been a great loss to to have me, but we all must go on. I mean, Miguel is in the big pie up in the sky, but I know you must be exhausted because because that was an epic thing, at the Nancy. How how did that come about? It was it was uh, it was real pretty epic. It, um, well, actually, I thought, of course, Miguel had been my friend for about actually forty years, and uh, about forty years. I met him when I was like eighteen or so, and. Um, he was my professor and then became my friend and we were friends till the day he passed. And so I knew that when he passed, something had to be done. And since we're in lockdown, the best way to do it was, was through Zoom. But uh, so I thought of, of doing a celebration for him. And um, I spoke to someone at the, at the New Regan Poets Cafe. And then I reached out to, um, to uh, Elena Martinez, who's, who is a uh, folklorist and she works with City Lore and also for the Bronx Music Heritage Center. And she's and, on the board of the Clemente Soto Vélez, yeah. so we're very fortunate to have her. <laughs> That's right, she is on your board. I almost forgot, but anyway, so I reached out to her and uh, then, you know, then uh, we reached out to Bob Holman. Bob Holman reached out to Lois Griffith and we formed the committee. We call it the committee. And um, we we came, you know, I, I, I told them about this celebration I wanted to do. And then we agreed to uh, incorporate other organizations to have them stream live simultaneously the, the celebration. Miguel Abration, and that's how that's how it initially started. It we it, actually we did it in two weeks. We put it together in two weeks, which is kind of weird, kind of weird and crazy. But you know, for those that didn't watch it, I'm sure you can watch it online. I mean, it was a who's who of a great uh, of great folks in in the arts. And but before we go forward with that, I I didn't introduce Nancy proper. I mean, Nancy is a writer, editor, activist, and educator. She's been featured on national public radio. She's been on Talk of the Nation. Um, she's also been anthologized in some very serious anthologies, including the Encyclopedia of Hispanic American Literature. Um, she is, has been inducted into the Museum of American Poetics. She is in Latino Leaders Magazine. As one of, she's been called one of the most uh, celebrated members of the Puerto Rican literary movement in the Big Apple. And, and then, of course, she is part of a Loud, you know the anthology that Miguel Algarín and um, and Bob Holman did, as well as um, as Ishmael Reed also included her in um, a Powwow, American short fiction from then to now, and many other books. We're not gonna. I don't want to get caught up with that, but but still, it's a it's a very uh, prestigious CV if you want to call it that way. And and Nancy's also a hardcore activist in in her own right for for the environment, most notably and also for the voices of women in, in poetry and such. So um, anyway, um, Nancy, I, I, I was looking over through your, through your bio and thing, and, and I saw you you graduated from, from Rutgers. Is that where you met Miguel, right? Is that where you met Miguel at Rutgers? Yes, yes. I met him at Rutgers University in New Brunswick um, when he was uh, 
Uh, he had just become the uh, chairperson of the Puerto Rican Studies Department there, had taken the reins from um, uh, Dr. Maria Canino, who was one of the people who actually created the department. And um, that's, when, that's when I met him. Yes. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I saw you also did art history. I mean, be, besides, you know, you had a major in art, art history and Puerto Rican studies. When, when, what, what kind of um, art history did you do? Was it like, uh, what, what art history? Like, <laughs> well, you're the expert in this field, so I got to be careful. No. I, did, <laughs> I did a bachelor's uh, in actually was art history, but it was studio art. It was actually painting, uh, 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 etchings, drawing, you know, and, uh, and that in combination with art history, um, art history from, from, oh God, from Europe, from Europe, you know, to, to the United States, you know, we covered uh, so much, so many, uh, movements i mean i can't even like begin to to talk about what you know what movements we covered i mean everyone from El Greco to you know uh the the surrealist you name it i mean it was you know and my initial idea was to become a visual artist actually okay. and i did uh, several uh pieces of work which i then when i started writing i stopped doing the artwork because I wanted to funnel my energy into one thing. So um, up here and there, I'll do a drawing, but um, I do, I didn't, the one thing I did not let go of, thank goodness, in a way was photography. I love photography and I used to, uh, of course, develop my own photographs and things, but now it's like, um, uh, I just do it you know, like everyone else with an iPhone. So, you know, but I love photography. I love the arts. I love the arts, period. So, you know, that's well, how would, and, and looking at your, you know, your other studies, it's very exciting because then in your MA, you, you also did some cinema studies and, and script writing at NYU. And you end up with this PhD in English lit from, from SUNY Binghamton. So you're really, it's an exciting uh, study, uh, study career. I was like, wow, I didn't know that, you know, so, wow. Um, anyway, so um, when I was, when I was reading up on you a little bit, because we know each other, but you know, it's one thing, personal and then on paper, right, Dr. Dr. Mercado, uh, I saw that, that you were published in an anthology in France, right? Something like, uh, what was it? Changer l'Amérique Anthologie de la Poésie Protestataire des États-Unis or something like that. And, um, and it was about uh, poetry of protest, right? The poetry of protest. How, how did that come about? Well, that was uh, one of, uh, in my career, one of my highlights. Um, I I had uh, I worked with a, a literary journal for eleven years as an editor called Longshot, which which is not being published any longer. But we had um, Longshot was a great publication that was uh, begun by two Rutgers U Rutgers University students also, um, and with the help of Allen Ginsberg and Charles Bukowski and all of these great literary figures helped to create that publication and then I came in uh, a little a little later and um, worked with them for 11 years so I wrote a, a poem um, about my grandfather actually and um, um, these uh, this group it was like a cultural group to, from France took notice well they uh, took notice of, of the work in Longshot and they took notice of that and they they spoke to one of the uh, one of the creators of Longshot, Elliot Katz, and he referred them to me. They liked my piece, and so he got them in communication with me. And then, um, thank goodness, I was published in in the anthology. And also, it was trans. It's in, it's in French. It's in French. Yeah. And how was how was the experience? Did they translate it, or they asked you to find someone to do it, or? Did they translated it, and they published it in English and French, and. They were wonderful. I mean, they they had they flew me over to France, wow. and I was there. I presented at the University of Nantes, and I presented in um, in a jazz club in in I think it was Paris. But um, we were we were there for a week. I was there for a week. All expenses paid, 
and they paid me, which was like incredible. I couldn't believe it. It was like a dream come true. This was like in 1998. And um, that was really one of the biggest highlights of my, you know, writing career. I mean, it was, it was a dream. It was a dream, you know, what can I say? And they were so nice. They were really great people. They took us around. We went to great restaurants. I mean, it, it was just incredible. It was near, near the Christmas holiday. So we got to see all the, how beautiful Paris looked, you know, during that season. And Nantes was wonderful, was a beautiful town. It's just great. We went into the, into the vineyards and, um, we went to a little house where we where we rehearsed with a jazz band. It was, it was just, I, I can't, it's like a dream, you know, it was, it was wonderful, you know. And I went with Kimi Kohan, another, well, very established poet now. We went together, they had us go together to, the hotel was beautiful, I mean, it was great, you know. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like a great experience. I'm so, I'm so proud of you and so happy, you know, this is such a hard scrabble job, right? The arts, but every now and then you get, you get the treatment, right? You get the yeah, treatment. Once in a blue moon, once in a blue moon, you know, two or three times in a lifetime, I guess. Unless you're really famous, you know, I guess, you know, like, uh, you know, like some of the real top literary figures, you know. Well, talking about literary figures, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard, and I don't know when it's going to come, but it, it, uh, to me, it's certainly overdue in the sense that, I mean, you, you, you know, right now it's just gotten cool and the New York Poets Movement and stuff, but you've been there since, what, 79 or something? I mean, you've been kind of, uh, you've been there, and, and you've, you've had the direct exposure, and, and, and some of these amazing poets not only took notice of you, but encouraged you till you became one of the, one of the guys or however you want to call it. I, I don't know, because I remember you hanging out, you know, uh, with, with, with Miguel and seeing you with Pedro and this and that. So, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of overdue because it's, it's a generational thing. People move on. Miguel is in the big slam up in the sky <laughs> with Pedro and Lucky and, and, and Pinero and so on and so forth. So now I think it's, it's people like you and, and maybe Papoletto and, and of course, you know, Mariposa is right there also, you know, on your heels and, and blah, blah, blah. So, so how does it feel? I mean, how, how do you feel to be part of this, to be, to be part of this legendary sort of moment in, in, in New York literature, in Puerto Rican literature of the diaspora and in your own personal history? Well, I feel, uh, um, I mean, I don't know. I, I, in a way, I don't know because it's like, it's like I'm in it. So it's hard to right. look at it from the outside, you know, and um, it's been a lot of hard work for me because a lot of times, for whatever reason, I'm like the one that's, that's sort of uh, not at the forefront a lot of times of, of, of things, you know, I'm not, you know, um, a lot of times, a lot of times I do have a great accomplishments, I believe, anyway, humbly saying it, but, uh, but there's been a lot of things, it's, it's sort of touch and go is what I'm trying to say, you know, I get, I'll hit, so, I'll hit something and it'll be great, and then I'm passed over for some great other thing, you know, and that's how it is, you know, so um, I'm fortunate to have been able to get to where I've gotten and to accomplish what I've accomplished because I, co I come also from a humble family, you know, um, uh, a family that was not, we weren't even middle class, I mean, you know, and so it was, it was a struggle and, you know, to make it. And uh, I, I made it on fellowships and scholarships and, you know, that's, that's how I got here academically and my brains, I, I do have some brains and, uh, and, you know, uh, work just working as much as I can, you know, and, and I'm not the type of person that works every day like that. I'm not, I just try to, whenever I, I, I am engaged in a project, I try to make it the best I can, you know, but I know other poets that are like publishing, like, factories they're like factories you know but i don't i don't look at poetry that way either so that's another that's another that's another subject another you know so right, right. well you also 
I mean, I remember meeting you. I mean, I had the privilege of, we, we had the privilege of meeting thanks to Boricua College, you know, back in the early 2000 or so, 2001 or something. So I know you're also invested in, in, in teaching, which, which certainly, you know, it's a, it can be love hate. I mean, I, I love it. I'm still doing it. And, and I think you do too. But, you know, sometimes you're like, oh my God, I wish I had some more time. For, for, for creation, be it painting or, or theater or, or, or writing, but, but it's also a very, um, you know, very satisfying endeavor. How, how, how does that dovetail your, your writing and, and the teaching? How, how do you, you know, deal with those two? Well, I, I, um, I teach uh, American literature, uh, which, is, which means all of us, you know, because we're all here. We're all part of American literature, Latinos, Latinx, you know, um, African Americans, Asian, you know, we're all part of the, you know, uh, this uh, growing literature that's constantly, you know, um, in growth. Um, so, I, so that's that's part and parcel uh, of what I do in terms of uh, it goes hand in hand with the teaching that I do and. I, the love hate relationship is that I love my students. They're wonderful. And, um, but you know, having to have, having to be, uh, uh, sort of under the, the control of another, of someone else, you know, you have to be at work at this time. You have to do X amount. That's what kills me. Um, more than anything else. I, I, I just, hate that actually you know just, what about the zoom what about the zoom reality because I, I i imagine you are also teaching via zoom these days like like most of us at least at in the college level and uh so how is that do you i mean given that this is terrible i mean we we all hate it and we want to like poetry is a contact sport at least the way <laughs> that the new york poets have have sort of made it such a contact sport but but in terms of teaching do you prefer the zoom um the zoom reality or does it help a little bit or, or not really well i i i think well now on the cove you know because of covid of course yeah i am i am uh, dealing with the students through zoom it's in some ways it's it's a lot better for me because then i i have more flexibility in terms of what i can do in between those times that i'm teaching here because i'm here i'm stable i'm not running commuting an hour each way to get to the to the uh to the college you know so i i have more time to work and focus on my my own um projects and i also don't i don't think i sacrifice on a college level i don't sacrifice the students learning because we we see each other face to face it's just not in person and they do the work that they would have done up any, you know, if we saw each other in person or not. I just don't have the opportunity to to uh, socialize with them, which I love because they, you know, the students always give me and you know positive energy. And but um, I I don't have a problem I, honestly with the Zoom uh, situation. The only thing is that of course we can't. We can't do anything else. We can't. We cannot have poetry readings in person, really. We can't at, here, especially because we have win, here's winter, you know, in uh, in a place where uh, there's the the weather's more cooperative. You might be able to go outside and have a socially distanced poetry reading, you know, or something like that. En but, el morro, en el morro. Yes. <laughs> Yes, but now he, here, you know, it's hard to do that. I mean, you can't, you know, so I haven't been to a reading in person. Forget it. And I, maybe I went one time, I think I went since the COVID thing began. To a well, listen, the reason we're talking like this is also part of the reality of the theater, Teatro La Tea. I, we can't have any audiences, uh, the Clemente, um, the other theaters in the Clemente, the same thing. But that, that I'm, I'm bringing that up because, you know, most people know you as a poet, Nancy, myself included. And, uh, but you have also penned several plays. And um, I think the most recent one was Away, uh, 96, or that's, that's what I could dig up when I, when I was uh, looking into, you know, into, into your publishing and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, are you still writing plays? Talk, talk to us a little bit about the play writing aspect of your, of your literary endeavor. Well, I I uh, I used to I ran a youth theater group for ten years in Jersey, 
um, the the Young Life Theater Group. And every year, practically every year of that, of when I, I, I worked with them as an artistic director, um, I wrote a play for them, young young adults, you know, and um, and I had a I had I've been very fortunate because by then I knew I knew the other artists you know Pedro Pietri I knew Bimbo Rivas um, I knew Pregones the people from Pregones so I had them come into Jersey uh, we used to get um, grant monies and then I would have them contract them to come into Jersey and work with the uh, with the teenagers and stuff from the youth center because I used to run the youth center too I was the director of the youth center. And uh, that's how the plays, you know, uh, began. And also, since I had studied um, screenwriting and and uh, and motion pictures and film at, at NYU, so it came naturally in a way, you know. And I, I love. Uh, I haven't written lately any plays, um, but I love the process of writing plays because it's, you know, you all the character for me anyway. All the characters come they show up in my head and they talk to me and so i have everything is i visual everything is visualized before i put it down on paper and um it's just it's a wonderful process and i had the great um um fortune to co-write actually a play with pedro pietri that i'm very proud of but i haven't been able to do uh uh after we we put it on on stage with with the uh with the kids we haven't been able to do much after that with it because he passed away and then he has his uh, estate is being run by um um i think i guess it, she was his wife or and then so it, it gets complicated you know well, that's, love, that's alicia in project land alicia yeah. okay okay well, i would love to stage that play i would love to stage it but well, I, I would love for you to consider la Dea when you're like thinking about it if, if pedro's estate allows i mean that would be an interesting thing to um you know to put up sometime yeah wow yeah and then uh it's a great play it really is hilarious you know and it's a really great play and um the another play that I did, I was contracted by the Centers for Disease Control back then to do a play about uh, women with AIDS or about AIDS, about AIDS at that point. And so I did it about a woman with that contracted AIDS, and um, that's called that's the play called Away. And so the um, the agreement was that I would write the play. I would I would sell the rights to the Centers for Disease Control, and then they would be able to allow anybody in throughout the United States to uh, re reproduce the play, um, because all of the money being um, raised was to go to AIDS research, and and so that's how that happened. And fortunately, the play was done in several states, and I think it was even done in in Puerto Rico. So. Mm -hmm. That's how that one came about, and that was an exciting project. And we did the play. We also did the play at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center at the Victoria Theater. So that was really wonderful. Yeah. And do you see that? Do you see a potential for another play, or a, do you, you got to be seized by the spirit? Or <laughs> right now you don't you don't know if that's that's coming yeah. up or any any what's with the play writing? It's it's uh I don't know. It's kind of in a way it's weird because I sort of ebb and flow and go, you know, whatever in a way comes. And, and, and some people see that as to my detriment, I guess, because I'm not like co consistently working on, you know. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't mind writing another play. I think that would be great. It's, it's a lot of work dealing with uh, when, you know, if you're writing a play, the, the beauty was that I was able to write the play and I was able to direct the plays. Right. So that was great because then, you know, but I had, you know, I had almost, almost total control over the project. But see, when you write a play and you have to deal with the director, then you have to deal with, you know, it's just, it gets kind of crazy. It gets, it gets complicated. Right, yeah. right, right. I know. So writing the play is wonderful. It's dealing with the people after you write the play that becomes, you know, the yeah. chaos, you know, ensues, you know. And uh, I would love to write a play and do it. I, I would do it out there in a heartbeat, you know. Or maybe one of the plays are already written could be done, too. I'd be happy to do that. That would be great.
Oh, yeah. I, we have an open end. You have an open ended invitation. That would be that. I mean, we're always looking for for material. And I, you know, it's it's one of the beautiful things about this tertulia talking to people. You know, you do a modicum of research. I also have a splendid uh, ally, uh, a guy called Carlo Dorta, who helps me research. So things come up, and and I learn. I learn about 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 the people I'm I'm interested in. So so that's uh, yeah. Let's let's talk about it. But also since we're talking a little bit about Revolucer, right? You write the play and then you gotta like deal with the show. Let's talk about one Revolu that's always been a constant in, um, you know, in, in the New York uh, poets, let's say, uh, trajectory. And, and that is that, that whole relationship between the, the, the diaspora, las letras de la diaspora, the writers such as yourself and that long tradition, um, you know, of, of Pietri, that's Pietri back there and, um, and Miguel and, and, and so many others. And then the island, you know, and, and you have you have spoken uh, about that, you know, that you have always made reference to uh, uh, the importance of, of a greater union between La Isla and, and, and New York or, or the United States. And so and, and Latin America. So I find you have a very broad, you know, broad minded, inclusionary and, and visionary sort of uh, uh, way of, of thinking about, about, about our literature. Uh, so, so talk to us a little bit about that, you know? Well, I, uh, yeah, I, I just think that, um, part of, of, in my opinion, part of the reason why we've been sep we've been so separated now, we're not as, as much anymore, thank goodness, but the Puerto Rican community on the island and the Puerto Rican community here on the mainland, uh because in the in the beginning was you know it's all a, a a political situation you know um you know you you get you have uh it's ingrained in you you know uh uh that you're in the, an individual you know you have to you have to uh um succeed as an individual you have to compete with the next guy you know um, and then, you know, the whole, the whole situation of separating families, because that was done deliberately, you know, the whole upheaval of the economy on the island and, and, and families having to leave in order to, uh, initially, I'm saying not, not, not now with the whole, um, hurricane situation, you know, which is a different, the different migration here, but Initially, like my parents uh, had to leave. Are your parents from Ponce? De donde son ustedes? Ponce. Yeah, yeah, we're from. Uh, yeah, my mother is from Ponce, her family, and then my father was from Peñuelas. Okay. So, but you know, at the, you know, so that caused that caused um, a great division, you know, in our uh, in our people, and uh, you know, I mean, it's just. It's complicated, you know, and so it's complicated because you have, you know, you have an island that's being dominated by another, another culture, another, you know, I mean, we've been hammered since the beginning. You can't use Spanish. You can't show your flag. You can't, the women have been sterilized, you know, so many things we've been, and we continue to be hammered. I mean, now Trump also hammered us to, you know, uh, when uh, when Maria came, Hurricane Maria, and then he gave us some money and then took it away, and then you know, and then the uh, the whole political situation on the island is a mess, in my opinion, you know, too. So you know, all of this es un revolu, you know, like you said, and those it was hard, you know, was the whole thing of of of, uh, of competition. So you had the 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 Puerto Ricans on the island. And the Puerto Ricans here, and then you know the Puerto Ricans here. Some of them didn't know Spanish or didn't know Spanish well, and that was seen as uh, something that wasn't was not positive. And in the beginning, but now, now I think the situation is is people are in this, the new generations and people are understanding more of what what the historical um, situation has been and how it has, it has placed us in this kind of situation which is terrible because, you know, divide and conquer, you know? So uh, hopefully now it'll be, it'll, it'll continue to get better and, and, and people will continue to unite 
more. I hope, I hope people should unite all over, not, not whether it's, you know, uh, a Puerto Ricans from the mainland versus Puerto Ricans from the island, but we should unite. I mean, I, I work with, I've worked with all kinds of groups and any kind of group that's willing to work and be, um, be good, be, be good in the sense that, uh, you know, egalitarian and, and someone who's, who's, who's uh, um, I say it, um, integral, has integrity, then it's good to me, man, I'm there, you know, like I don't, whether they're on the island here, there, Australia, I don't care, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but so, I, I, I do agree with you. I think there's a, a, a new, a newfound sense of, there's been for some time now, a newfound sense of, of respect, of tremendous respect for the New Yorican movement and in, in the, from the island perspective, whereas originally it was more like, ah, you know, that's not Puerto Rican literature. And, yeah. I, and I find that there's been a more, um, a, an open acknowledgement of, of, of the triumph of, of people like Miguel, Pedro, yourself, Mariposa, you know, and how you have really held, held up the fort, put on the flag high, and, and also, you know, shown a remarkable, what do you say, dexterity, a colonial dexterity, made, uh, made something that was pejorative or negative into an asset and use the, the empire as it were or whatever, the tremendous power of English to put us in the map. And, and that, that's really cool, you know? Well, that, that's why I did my, my, my doctorate in English literature because it's like I said to myself, well, look, I mean, I love Spanish. I don't have a problem with Spanish, but if these guys need to know my story, the way they're going to know it is if I write it in English. Because these, these guys, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to curse here. These guys, okay, don't, they believe in English only. I mean, how, how backwards is that? So, so, you know, so I'll write, I'll write my stuff in English. It could always be translated, you know, into other languages. But I'll write it in English so that you understand what you're doing. Plus, you know, I mean, I, I have arguments about this because I do still, I, I teach Spanish language at, at, at academia, but ladrón que roba ladrón tiene 100 años de persona, perdón, the Quechua poet, the, the poet of Mexica, the poet of, of, of all these other languages also had to grapple with Spanish only. So, I mean, this is not a new thing, you know, like how many poets in, in the native tongues were confronted with perhaps the same sort of intolerance that 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 uh, Puerto Ricans in the island, uh, I mean, in the in the mainland in the United States, were confronted with. So it's it's a cycle. It's it's una cadena bien larga, you know. Of, of well, the well, the thing is, if it involves people, humans, that's gonna happen, you know, because that that's just a hu a, a hu exactly, human, you know. It's, and yeah. unfortunately, for better or worse. It's, it's a human thing, you know? So we're gonna, unfortunately, I mean, we shouldn't because I, I've been watching, now that I've had this time to be here, I've been watching documentaries here, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, scientists being uh, interviewed, and, stuff, and it's true, man, we gotta wake up. We're all connected. We're all connected. And it's not only human beings connected, we're connected to the earth. We've been, we've been so dislodged from the earth that people, it's a chaotic situation because people don't have an, an, an idea of what their connection to the earth is any longer. And I mean, that's detrimental to our survival as a species, you know? So we're all connected and people, people need to understand that. The animals already know that, you know? The animals know that already instinctually, you know? But human beings, you know, unfortunately, they begin to believe that they're so, um, how do you say it? So, so like on top of things and all knowing and everything. And so they dismiss, you know, things. Meanwhile, you know, uh, we're destroyed. The biosphere is going to pot. Meanwhile, huh? <laughs> the biosphere is getting shot. Meanwhile, we're, we're, we're done. Let me tell you something. I know people say, oh, she's negative. Okay, fine. But let me tell you something we're not going to reverse the damage that we've done to the earth environmentally, okay? Right now we're battling COVID. COVID is a piece of cake next to what's gonna happen environmentally. And it's gonna happen in our lifetime. It's not gonna happen in a hundred years. It's gonna happen now. If we don't, 
I mean, we, we have to stop, completely stop all fossil fuel uh, usage and all everything. I mean, stop it, not just tone it down. It has to be stopped on a worldwide scale for us to even start incrementally trying to get back somehow. That's not going to happen. People are not going to do that, you know, so... Well, but before I want to, I want to go take that up. Uh, I had that more like towards the end to, to end in that note. But, but before I get there, I wanted, um, I know you were, uh, there was this podcast called De Noche in New York, uh, Soul Latinx, um, Wilfred Serrano, I think it was 2015. And you also, you know, talked a little bit about your admiration for the, for that remarkable poet called Julia de Burgos. What, what's your relationship to, to, to that sort of like massive figure in our, tra in our trajectory? Because she was here, she wrote in Spanish, but then she went to New York. Um, she, she had a very, uh, you know, grim ending. It is just really, really hard to, to take, you know, that one of her greatest poets ever um, uh, suffered like so many of our people. So what, what's your relationship with, with Julia de Burgos and her work? Well, I, stu I studied her, I studied all her work when I was in, in college and um, uh, I was fortunate, you know, to, uh, to have the, the, tr the work translated, although I, I could read, I could read Spanish and write in Spanish, but of course, because I'm, I was born and raised here in, in the United States, it's easier for me, it's faster for me to do it in English. Um, but her, I wanted to know who she was because I kept hearing her name all the time, you know. Um, and so I studied her and um, she, she was an influence in the sense of how she dealt with her life as a poet and the fact that she was not into what I say, what I call the commercialization of, of poetry. You know, she was, a, she was quote unquote a real poet. Um, she really, um, loved the 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 art uh, or the and the act of writing poetry and um you know it was unfortunately unfortunate that she died the way she did here it, actually here in new york in manhattan um and uh, but she and then she managed to write two i believe two poems in english uh before she passed so she was a great figure in that sense, and the way that she led her life uh, to me, that's, that's uh, the biggest lesson that I take from her is that, of course, her work is beautiful too. Um, uh, and I, I, I loved her work. I, I always love her work, but the way that she carried herself in life was what, was what uh, in, you know, uh, influenced me. Like a model, like a model for, for, for another poet. Um, and, you know, talking about models and, and such, you, you must be the model for, for a hell of a, of a lot of other poets right now. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a responsibility that comes with, 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 with the level of accomplishment that you've achieved. And, and I was looking at, in particular, it, it caught my attention, this uh, Frederick Douglass um, uh, award, you know, um, I, I think on the occasion of the bicentennial, you received the recognition, uh, you know, for very few people that embody the spirit and the work of Frederick Douglass. So that's that's such a that's such a figure. Again, we talked about Julia de Burgos, so now we're talking about you know Frederick Douglass, and and you received this award. But um, when, when was this award um, bestowed upon you? This was this was uh, in I believe. Last last year, cool, last year. very recent, right? Very recent, yes. I mean that that's one of the my my greatest uh, moments in my career was to get. I mean that was like that floored me when I when I found out that I I had been named as one of these two hundred people, you know, in the country. Um, I was floored by that. I really, I was, I was in tears. You know, it just. Frederick Douglass. I mean, how that's the highest, one of the highest achievements you could, you know, you could ever uh, achieve, in my opinion, you know, like, wow. Well, plus, plus, as you talk the talk, but you walk the walk too. So you're not just about, you know, just a literary far off ivory tower kind of <laughs> poet. You, you are very engaged and a very real, real person. Um, so, 
So, you know, this, this kind of brings both, it, it's an award that considers both. It's not just like you're outstanding here, but not, so, so, wow. I mean, did you attend the ceremony? I mean, was oh, it? Yeah. Yes, I did. I had a great time. I met all of these great iconic people. I mean, it was amazing. I met the family, his family, his descendants, they're friends of mine now. And I just, it was another dream, another dream, you know, like you have these dreams that come true. This was another dream that came true. I went with a great friend of mine, Donald Lorenzo. We went to Washington. They held the ceremony at the uh, Library of Congress. So this was, thank goodness, this was before COVID. So I, I had a chance to hang out, you know, with other uh, um, um, people that were other great, you know, figures that were there. Um, and I'm terrible at names, so I forget names, especially when I'm put on the spot. But um, it was just, it was an incredible, oh my God, I can't even begin to describe it. It was so incredible. Beautiful, beautiful ceremony, beautiful place. I mean, it was just great. I, ha I had the, uh, the, the award that they gave me, and it just... I, I I don't have words, you know, to describe it. When I when I Sandra Cisneros was there, for example, she got an award. Este, uh, Amy Amy Goodwin from uh, you know from Democracy Now was there. I got to talk to her, you know. So you have these great uh, 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 Tansor, the 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 Muslim uh, sister who uh, who was the one who created the uh, a woman's. Um, the women's uh, protests, the big women's demonstration. She was one of the creators of that. I met her, became a friend with her. So there were these great figures there. That was uh, Maria Hinojosa also got an award. And oh, then- yeah. Wow, Maria, yes, I know her. <laughs> you have, then you had other people who were not there, but are huge and got the award, you know, other figures that got, did make it to the ceremony, but they also were named. So it was amazing. Can I say, <laughs> you know? So Nancy, here we are talking about the Frederick Douglass Award, and and we didn't talk about the 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 American, you know, the American Book Award. Uh, that that's even more galactic, right? Or not more galactic, but it is galactic. So 2017, how 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 did that come about? Well, that that was also like like the Frederick Douglass uh, Award, the American Book Award was also like a shock. I mean, I I um. I was given the award for lifetime achievement, and um, it was it was uh, announced. And you know, when it was announced, I I was here just you know um, doing something. I don't know, writing or whatever. I was just, and then uh, I I saw it. Somebody called. I don't remember exactly how it happened, but but and I thought actually that it was there's another person by my same name who's yeah. also Athena, and who's also a writer. She works for, I think, Scholast Scholastic. Scholastic. Scholastic? Yeah. No, no. Yes, yeah, Scholastic Books, yes. Oh. And I thought the award was for her, you know? So when I read it, I saw it in the, um, in the different newspapers. When I saw that it said Nancy McGallow, part of the New Yorican movement, I knew it wasn't her mm. because that's not, that's not her. And so then I, I, called a friend of mine to verify it, you know? And I, I called him and I said, listen, this, this, I think this happened, but I'm not sure. Could you see if it's true? And he verified it. That was on a, on a, uh, a night, uh, uh, you know, and I, I couldn't believe it. I was in shock, you know? I mean, I'm so, so uh, gratified by that award, you know? It's just amazing, an amazing accomplishment, you know, for me. I well, think. now we have bragging rights because we have an American book award, Nancy Mercado at Tertulia. So now, now, now we're part of the of the prestige. Thank you, thank you for bringing that on. You're crazy, man! I love you. <laughs> you know, yeah, me too. Guys. I love you too, love you guys. You know, you guys are doing such great work over there at, at Tertulia and Clemente and stuff. And uh, I love hanging around with you guys. It's so bad that we can't do it now because of the plague, you know? It's coming back. It's coming back. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can create some sort of poetry uh, event, a recurring event at the Clemente. I, I already spoke a little bit with, with Edwin and Urayuan and Mariposa. 
and I think you you got to be involved. So we'll 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 talk about that when the time comes. Well, you know, tell me something. Since we're, I mean, it's so weird right now with COVID, and because this yeah. is not a moment. This is like a, this is like an eternity, an ever evolving eternity. But you know, you also wrote, or you you came up with something very special. Also after 9/11, remember that? Now that seems like like eons ago, like uh, like a lifetime ago. But but it's still it's still very much in the hearts and souls of so many people around the world, and especially New Yorkers, and especially people uh, like us that uh, were downtown or or you know have have very specific downtown uh, roots. Uh, yeah. what, what what is your 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 souvenir, as it were, uh, for lack of a better word, of of the 9/11 of the 9/11 tragedy? What, what what do you remember? Well, you know, it's it's. Uh... When it happened, that was up in, in Binghamton uh, working on my doctorate. So I, I wasn't in the city, but um, as soon as I was able to get to the city, I came, I came back that weekend, actually, I came back. And um, came back for that weekend to, to, to be here. I have a great um, love for, this, for the city of New York. Um, and so I was very... Uh, it was horrible to go through that um, for many reasons, you know, and, uh, but, but the, the, the punch in the gut to the city was like really uh, terrible, you know? And um, so of course, like, I guess like any and many poets, I wrote about it and, um, and I was uh, again fortunate enough that someone saw the the, the work um, that I had written, and um, and then you know um, they asked me to they interviewed me and, and for a PBS uh, uh, special on yeah that's what I saw I mean that's what came to my attention right uh, yeah um. yeah the ten year anniversary of of it uh, of the uh, that disaster and so they interviewed me and. Uh, that was that was an amazing experience, also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they also aired it on um, national public radio. That was great, also. That they did that, you know, with that that one poem that uh, uh, that I wrote about commemorating that because I went that downtown. They had everybody's or a lot of the they were looking for survivors of the tragedy, and they had their photographs up on uh, along like uh, I think it was a fence or something downtown and so I went there to, to see all those thousands of actually thousands of hundreds of photographs and, and, and notes written to these people. This was before they found out that in, in that whoever uh, you know mostly the people who were in the buildings didn't make it you know um, so I went to see that and that's what struck me so much that I wrote a piece about that and I wrote a piece, you know, about what was going on around me. There was, there were, there were these guys, you know, uh, selling souvenirs, you know, of, of the World Trade Center and the Statue of Liberty postcards, you know, and all. Because to see those two massive buildings come down the way they did, that was a traumatic, that was really traumatic for me. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it wasn't traumatizing enough to have all those people die in an instant, but also to then see these buildings just crumble down to was, you would think these buildings, and I used to go in those buildings all the time. And I used to actually, when I was working in Brooklyn, so I would commute under those buildings. And, uh, you know, they were so massive that you would never, you think Imagine that, that they could, that they could crumble. Right, right. Yeah, no, that they would be, they would be around like the pyramids forever almost, you know what I'm saying? And to see them go down like that was, that was a big, to me, that was a huge shock. And also, I thought that there were a lot of people that passed away there that died. But, you know, of course, when it first happened, we were under the the uh you know we were under the idea that that there were thousands of more people because you're talking about the world trade center we have you know thousands and thousands of people that work there you know and it was it was uh 
it was close to nine o'clock around eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning when the on a business day so we i mean it luckily more people were not killed i mean i thought it was going to be like an enormous amount of death you know and it was a lot i'm not saying it wasn't but i mean i thought it was going to be like an incredible amount of you know death and um it was terrible it was a really terrible situation and and getting back to to you know we were we were having a little chat about the identity and you know puerto rico and the united states and puerto ricans in the united states so you know how, what do we make out? And but but you're 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 such a flexible you know poet. I mean, you have diverse interests. Uh, you have your roots in Ponce or you know in the island and and uh, Ponce and elsewhere in Peñuela. But then you you're also so rooted, or you have New Jersey contacts or roots. You have the the, the Lower East Side and and your friends and 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 mentors and and all these things. So so what about identity? And 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 I and I ask you this question also from from my my own curiosity because you know i i like to to use chinese sources for my painting chino latino so and then i'm also committed to to printing silk screens that are very much about our puerto rican roots so what what do we make that what do we make out of of identity is it something fixed or or, or, or how do you evolve? How, how do you justify? Maybe it doesn't, that's not the right word. We don't need to justify anything, but I'm saying identity is an ever evolving uh, concern. How, how, how do you grapple with that? Well, yeah, well, I, I, it's, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I think identity is fluid. I think, you know, um, I I identify as a lot of different things and because I am I am all of those different things so so I should be able to identify as those I don't I don't like I don't like anything that's stagnant anyway you know I just don't I have you know okay I could deal with it for a little bit and then I get bored and I'm gone you know I I just don't so identity to me is is fluid is is a fluid thing i mean I, yes i'm puerto rican yes i'm latinx yes i'm latina yes i'm a woman yes I, you know this is it's, i'm a person of color i'm not you know i'm i'm mixed obviously you know so i you know it's just uh i'm non binary you know it's it's so many different things like i tell my fr my friends my queer friends like, i'm queer too you know like you know so yes why not you know like i am you know, and, and, and Nancy, Nancy is rara. Nancy is rara. <laughs> yeah, you know, the thing is that it's good to be, a, I think, to be able to go into all these different worlds because then you could, you could unite, you know, you could be part of, of, uh, and it's not, it's not a, I don't see it as a contradiction. I don't see it as hypocrisy. I don't see it. I, I just see it as, as, as a fluid thing. It's fluid, and we should uh, uh, welcome it and work with it and to our to our advantage for the positive, you know, for a positive thing. You, unity is a positive thing. I mean, if any type of unity that we can have that's good, that's a good. It has integrity, honesty, you know. Like a positive, like, right? Like a positive. Good. Yeah. So I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with. It. So in terms of identity, I'm like I'll fight for, you know. Puerto Rico, I'll fight for African American, of course, because you know it's all we're all part of the same thing, you know, we're all part of it, you know. So, well, I think it's part of that fluidness. I, I was gonna, I wanted to then segue back a little bit onto onto the the environmental concerns that that you have been vocal about publicly and that you were talking about just just now, just a little bit before. And and I was wondering if perhaps you know there's always a question of what's the role of poets in society, and I'm wondering if that role for you has distinctly um, sort of like the 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 seer, uh, the 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 talker of truth in regard to this environmental sort of um, uh, damage or 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 just unconsciousness that we have sort of lived with with for so long with that, that now we, we're waking up and say, what, you know, how did this happen? Is, is that the role of poets in society perhaps, or one of the main roles perhaps of poets today, like the environment? 
Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think it definitely is. I think it's important to, uh, you know, truth is, um, is a hard it's a hard concept to grasp because it's it's you know it's also something that could that could change in with time and transform and evolve and you know, but uh, I think it's important when you know when you could capture something at the moment, capture it and distill it and, and say what your truth is about it. I think that's important uh, in poetry and that poets are the ones that, that usually do that. I mean, you know, usually, uh, uh, and I say usually because there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people that call themselves poets that don't really do that. You know, that don't, that just are, unfortunately out for it's a di they look at it as a different thing they look at it as a way of, of uh, a vehicle that they'll use to become quote unquote famous or whatever or they're on stage or you know and to me that's not what what poetry is about to me that is not what poetry is about poetry is about serious business and uh, a lot of times I tell uh, poets, you know, there have, been, there have been so many poets that have been assassinated, you know, and killed because of what they've written or, you know, um, what they've said or published, you know. And, uh, you know, poetry is a serious endeavor. I mean, so I think in terms of anything that's happening politically, environmentally, you know, that uh, it's, it's part of poetry's obligation for it to come out and part of poet's obligation for them to put it out. Also like beauty too. Beauty of course is part of that also. You, it doesn't have to all be negative or, you know, uh, beautiful things. Um, the earth, animals, uh, people that are beautiful, you know, can also be doc and, and poetry is like a documentary process as far as I'm concerned. That's how I see poetry. It documents certain realities. Um, it may document them in a, in a certain way, in a poetic way, which is not um, clean cut like prose could be maybe more, but it is a, it is a form of documentary, documentation to me, you know, documenting truth, life, you know, so that's what I think, I, you know, I mean. Oh, there's always room to uh, grow and learn, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, talking about documentation, I mean, I, I just want to see if you remember or you care to say a few words before I ask you to read a poem. I would like to end this with a poem. And whether you believe it or not, we've been talking for an hour already. That's how wonderful a tertulia can be when, when there's like, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this respect. Um, so, so I have this picture here from 1986 at the Village Gate. And, and I think it's such an exciting picture because, um, you know, you have Piri Thomas is there, Amiri Baracas there. And then you're right next to, uh, you know, Miguel is looking at you. Alan Ginsberg is right there. Do, do you remember that, that moment? And Pedro Pietri is, is, is in the <laughs> forefront. What, what, do you, can you tell us anything about that moment, that day, 86, the Village Gate? Well, that was uh, from a series that we read in called Poets in the Bars. And uh, I think Bob Holman was one of the one of the people that had headed up that series, uh, made it come to fruition. And yeah, he's there too. Bob Holman is there too yeah. in the picture, of course, as well. Yes, he's there. And it was that. Uh, I mean, I, I that's one of the moments that I remember. You know, obviously Mar Marlies Mumber took that beautiful yes. photograph. Yes, yes, it's Marlies Mumber. I love that photograph. It's just. Uh, again, another dream come true. You know, I'm with all the Baracas there. I mean, Piri Thomas is in that photograph. It's an incredible piece, you know, of history, you know, and I'm I'm so fortunate that I was able to be there and that I read in the series. I mean, so that was great. You know, I mean, it was a great experience. I learned so much from all of these people and, you know, Ginsburg, the, the couple of times that I was able to, to talk to him and say he was such a... a a, uh, a generous person, you know, um, with his advice and, and in a, in a humble way, he wasn't, you know, full of himself or he was a wonderful person, you know, treated me so well. I mean, the few times that I got to speak to him, 
at St. Mark's Poetry Project. I had the uh, honor of reading in the same on the same bills with him and and Corso and and uh, you know other other incredible poets and Wallman and so Ashbury also I remember seeing Ashbury there John Ashbury and it's just crazy it was a crazy experience you know it's always been great it's been it's been a wonderful uh, wonderful experience you know to go through all of these these uh, situations, bad and good, you know? <laughs> so. Well, and we are on the day, the next to last day of the year, right? Of this moment, this incredible year of 2020, incredible, perhaps not in the most, uh, <laughs> the most wonderful way. And, and this is the last tertulia. We started this process in La Dea. I started this because I, I wanted to connect. We were all scared. We were all separated. And in some way, the technology, well, it, it has helped, you know, the Zoom thing and, and getting. So I would like to end this last tertulia of this very difficult year. And it's a wonderful tertulia because it's with you and, and we, have, uh, we have known each other for some time and, and enjoyed each other's company in different venues throughout the years. I would like to end this with you reciting a poem. Maestra, if you would honor us <laughs> with a poem tuyo, I would be- I would love to, I just, hope, I just hope that if I read a poem that's, it's, I mean, it's gonna be, it could be maybe ending the year in on a on a bad note. I don't wanna do that, you know? Because- I, well, I don't know, it's, <laughs> you're the poet, you're the seer, you're the poet, it's your, we want, we want a poem. Let me, let me, let me see if I can find it. It should be in here somewhere. Hold on a minute. Uh, okay, here's my, here. Well, is it, when was the, uh, the hurricane in Puerto Rico was 20, was it 2015? I, I thought it was more like, like 20, 2017, or you mean Maria? Right, I'll tell you. Yeah, it was 2017, right? It was more, I more. Think so. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I have a, a poem uh, about the, uh, the pandemic that I can read to you, uh, or, or I can read you a poem that has to do with the hur hurricane. Uh, you let me know which one you might want best, um, Miguel. Um, I'm looking, uh, it was 2017. I was just checking what the date was. I thought it was 2017, but I wanted to make sure. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I perhaps, Let's go into the pandemic. I mean, this is the moment that we're still in this moment. It will go on a little longer, even though we all are very hopeful because of the vaccine and, and this and that. So, so why don't you regale us with, with a poem about, about COVID? All right. Well, this is, uh, uh, this is called Plague, Plague America. It's called. It takes a plague to crystallize the malignancy occupying the White House that churns out death, a gross carnage of humanity stockpiled inside U-Haul trucks. It takes a plague to breach the lies we live in this America, bearing its mercenary truths, its decomposing law laws scavenged by elected vultures. A plague is what it takes to realize red baseball caps buffoons can freely amass assault rifles, the privileged, scant, illiterate, and starved, lined up for miles to reach food banks, gleefully waving soiled Confederate flags and tatters. A plague must be what it takes to discover our illusory lives the hamster wheel we've been sold, traveling on it all along toward manufactured dreams, toward nowhere in reality. It takes a plague to recognize we are orphans in this America, sparing no expense, we're marked for ruins, 
by the slothful elites who bask in swimming pools of our blood. A plague is what it takes to wake up from this American dream, to see our children encaged, our mothers, our fathers butchered in broad daylight, our homes mired in soot water, our lands laced of oil pipelines discharging at whim, scourging valleys filled of life, decimating our future under a foul dark layer of evil. A plague must be what it takes for our redress in the streets of this America, our decisive rebellion, our final renaissance. That, that, that was more than I bargained for, thank you. <laughs> It is, I but, but but I think it's it's an appropriate tone and and I mean who am I to 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 judge? But I'm saying for me it, it sounds like such an appropriate elegy, perhaps for lack of a better term, for for this year and for this moment. And um, but anyway, what are, what before we say final goodbye? Then um, any any words of uh, also after after that powerful poem. Um, what, what's your, um, your word of hope now for people that might be joining us, our friends, fellow poets, artists, and, and just people joining us, Latino, Latina, Boricua. Give me something for all of us to, to sort of go well, up with. Well, um, I think that we have, we, you know, we have to work. It's not, it's going to be hard because we have to work towards achieving, um, you know, uh, a balance. And I think we're on the cusp of a big change, which is a good thing, uh, humanity, in terms of how we see ourselves in the world um, and for a change for the better. So I'm hoping that um, it, comes, it comes sooner than not and, and that people, um, as long as we, we have open minds and compassionate hearts, you know, um, and compassion for every living thing, not just for human beings, because animals and the earth is very important. It's a, the earth is a living organism, you know, and, um, and we need it as much as, as, uh, as it may or may not need us, actually. As long as we come with open hearts and, and minds and compassion, you know, and try to understand other, other things, not just the, the next person, but other life forms and, and, you know, not, not come at it with an attitude of know, of all knowing because we don't, we don't actually, right. we don't know most things, you know. Um, so the, the, the universe or universes is, is so mass. I mean, we have no idea. We really don't, act, honestly, you know. So we have minuscule amounts of knowledge, you know, <laughs> about how things work. Uh, how life works, you know, and so as long as we understand that and and we come together in a, in a good way, in a positive way, things will will work out. You know, this pandemic will end. You know, and uh, you know we'll 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 go back to our lives, and hopefully we'll start you know dealing with the environmental situation. And now, thank goodness that we have a, a, a new. Uh, um, government coming into uh, you know into whatever power or however you want to say it and and it's not ideal of course but it's much better than what we had i mean you know we were dealing with pure evil here with with you know with trump and these people these people are neo-nazis let's be honest okay let's be straight there for a minute and you know they're they're neo-nazis stephen miller these people are nazis that you know that's what they are, you know, they're evil. They don't care. I mean, right now, Trump, and I know I'm dating this, this video by saying this, but Trump right now will refuses to sign this bill that was uh, uh, passed by the House and, and the Senate to help, you know, people to help uh, the business, small businesses. This guy is out golfing over in Florida or whatever. This is, you know, this is what we cannot do. This is who we cannot be. We can't be like that. We can't. We got to be the opposite of that, you know? Well, we'll end on that positive note of going <laughs> forward and on hum humility as a species and also 
Feliz Año Nuevo. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Feliz Año Nuevo. Gracias. Feliz Año Nuevo a todos. And thanks for joining uh, this last tertulia of 2020 with the poet, scholar, uh, professor, and activist, Nancy Mercado. Gracias, Nancy. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Gracias.